Hello there. Hey. Oh. Dropping this again. Nothing to see here. Okay. I took the weekend off for streaming. So I'm a day short now. I have to finish this today. Uh, hey everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. This should be working fine. And we're off. Okay, so this time I did a tiny bit of preparation. Um, in terms of six-sided, I didn't really want to do anything super fancy, but just go for a nice uh, honeycomb pattern. It's not the most exciting thing, but it's very nice. Very visually pleasing to look at. And... Uh, I thought I could do something cool with drooping honey that is kind of uh, wiggling around. And for that, I made a test of how I could like fake this kind of soft body uh, simulation effect with geometry nodes. So I uh, already made a setup that I'm going to redo completely. So. Yeah, just starting from scratch, but I already made a test just to see if it works. And uh, yeah, that's what it looks like. Very wiggly. Uh, it's not accurate. It doesn't really have this overshooting effect of uh, of something actually wiggling as it should when you're simulating it. But uh, I think it kind of works still. So I'm going to try and... Uh, have a have an animation where the honeycomb is kind of shaking around and then the the honey droops it's kind of leaking downwards it's animated like this and uh yeah a lot of people in the chat everyone um okay so just a quick explanation of how this works before we dive in and actually redo it from scratch the idea is that the whole animation is procedural with a node group. And that node group just takes the position of a point and changes it to another position. So far, so good. That's the animation. And the input of this node group is the time or the frame in this case. And um, by using this node group with different inputs, we can evaluate the animation at different points in time. And the idea then is to change when this animation is evaluated along the, the line here. So at the top, it's real time, basically. And then the further, the further along downwards you go, the further back in time the animation is evaluated, basically. It sounds very fancy, um, and it kind of works, but that obviously also then means that it's just going to be at positions that it would have been earlier on, and not overshooting or anything. So if I just change some parameters around like, uh, wait, like this one, which basically says how far back in time we go, it just completely falls apart. But you can see the effect taking place. And yeah, it's also kind of a cool effect, but uh, yeah, it's, it's just falling apart. For smaller values, it's just about right. And then there's all sorts of other cool parameters that you can just change around to make it look uh, like some crazy animations. It's a it's a very cool effect in general, and so I thought might as well just give this a go into the stream and just show how it's uh, how it's done. And it's yeah, it's it's quite cool how you can just use this on any sort of mesh. So here I'm just generating uh, the base mesh just to test this on. It's a very simple thing, and uh, yeah, the input could be anything. And the only thing we need is the mesh itself and then a mask of how it should be mapped in time, basically. Maybe I can... OK, 
Okay, last thing I, I'll show with this, and then I'll go into the actual file from scratch. Just the map. Oh, is it not showing? No. A little bit confused. Ah, it is showing. Never mind. So, this is the mask that I use basically to to map this back in time. And that's the only two things that the system needs to work, which is kind of cool. Then obviously the animation itself. <laughs> okay, you keep asking this question about uh, Demetra starting to rig snow. Uh, <laughs> I mentioned it again, and from what I understand, it's going to happen soon. So be hyped about some some rigging from Demeter. Uh, yes. It will be a thing. Okay. So as we do, just go into an empty file and start working. Um, so there's going to be two main segments to this. There's going to be um, building the procedural honeycomb shape and then the animation part that I just showed off that we're going to redo. And I think it might just be interesting to start with that animation part because the honeycomb itself is going to be relatively similar to other stuff that I've done before. But this is a little bit, oh, this is a little bit different. Not too different to work. Those are very similar, but uh, yeah, that's kind of the main interest point, I think. Okay, so let's add in a plane. Just delete the input geometry in, uh, in edit mode and then call this honeycomb. Then there's geometry nodes modifier. And I think I'm just going to build the exact same um, base shape that I had just now to, to test the animation on. And that's just a, a grid cube that I scaled down on the x and y axis like this. I move it down with a transform node. So the origin is oh wrong direction. Negative is here and then I instance this cube on the grid. Instance on points. this and then yeah you can just change the amount of of points here to get more like this and then uh, yes and then I use a random value to scale these around to just get a better uh, better idea of how this is going to look with different lengths of uh, of drooping honey. It's nice to just have a visualization like this. Just change the x and y minimum to be one so it doesn't scale it on that axis and then do something like this. Let's say 10 points. Ah. Oh, that's nice. Um, yes, I am in the studio right now. We have a little uh, recording booth or streaming booth here. It's a very isolated and cold and dark place. Because it's cut off from the heating. But we have a little heater here, so it's fine. Um, right, and then this needs to be realized. because we want to use the geometry as a whole and not just on its instances individually. Um, yes. Right, one thing that's going to be important later is that the, let's just turn on the wireframe, that the cubes have a whole bunch of uh, resolution along the z-axis. So I'm just scaling that up here. 
because they're gonna have to make these smooth shapes. Cool, so that's the starting point for the test environment. Um, yeah, I'll also just, as I basically do every single stream, but that's fine. We'll set up the viewer uh, environment. Oh, Blender frozen. No, it's fine. So we can uh, take a look at some of the fields as we need them. Let's just add the attribute. It's called viewer. And then also write it to the viewer attribute here. theory, shouldn't this already work? Shouldn't this give us a bunch of random values? Mm. What if I capture this vector on the point domain? Ah, right. <laughs> Sorry. I need to assign the material. Not like this. Set material. There we go. Random values. Okay. So that's the viewer setup that we can just use at any point. It's going to be useful later. And uh, yeah, that's the base setup. Now, let's start with the animation first. So the animation is just going to be using a set position node and then some noise as an input to manipulate the position. Let's close the shader view. Add in some noise texture. Um, and as an input, I just need 1D because this is going to be driven with a time. Just add in a value input node for that and then type in hashtag frame because that's going to create a driver that is directly hooked up with the frame as you can see and that's going to be my input for the animation yeah and then i just use the what the uh, noise texture gives me with some vector math to manipulate the uh, geometry position. For example, if I just want to have some wiggling, uh, I can just add an offset uh, like this. But I want to have the um, the average offset to be zero, and because this nice texture is returning values between zero and one, I subtract 0.5 in each component first. Oh. And then this can be also scaled up. We'll just add a multiply node, set it to one for now, but we can just scale up that one later to just, uh, to just change the amount of uh, noise. And actually, yes. So one cool thing that I can do here, um, instead of just making this a node group and then having a geometry in and geometry out, I can make something a little bit more fancy using the power of fields. Um, instead, inside of the node group that's going to be my animation, I can use the position field. Because that's going to be evaluated at any point where this field is actually used alongside a geometry. Um, but I don't need to care about that geometry now. I can just use the position as as a field, as a callback, uh, as something that's going to be the position later on. And then um, use some more vector math. Oh, God damn it. And basically just add to the position the offset directly and then giving that new position out. So the output here is going to be my uh, position after 
the in, uh, animation basically. So position is coming in here and then we add the offset depending on the time and then we give out the new position and that's going to be set outside here. And that should already work if I just, uh, yeah, let's just take a look at it. There we go. It's jittering around quite a lot, but that's fine. Okay, so I'll add a math node to control the the speed of this whole thing by just dividing by something like 40, which basically means that every frame, every 40 frames, this is going to increase by one, uh, which makes it a little bit more uh, uh, reliable or better to to visualize, kind of. <laughs> You could also just change the scale of the noise, but it's a little bit more easy to work with something that doesn't change by a whole number each frame, but more like one num uh, one increment every 40 frames. Yeah, and that for now is just an offset. So on top of that, let's just add another noise. And uh, right now, this is just the exact same noise. But if we just offset the input with an add node by, yeah, why not 40? This is just going to be another noise. I mean, it's going to be offset in time, but no one's going to notice. It's going to be fine. And then we use that additional noise to uh, add some rotation. So I'll do a vector rotate operation, set this to Euler, and then just plug it into the rotation here. Beautiful. And we got some very nice wiggling around. Cool. Um, so that is already a big chunk done, because the cool thing about this is that this is deterministic. With this node group, we know at any point in time how the geometry is going to be transformed with the animation. And that's very important for this to work, animation. Because then, instead of giving it the current time we can just give it a past time. Just subtract one, and then duplicate this node group and evaluate it a frame earlier. And we have all the information of the current frame and the previous frame in one node tree here. And we can do things with it, which is super nice. And in theory, we could do a bunch of physics stuff with that. And uh, what we're going to do now is some fake physics stuff. Because I couldn't be bothered to actually think about this longer. <laughs> uh, I mean, it looks nice enough. You'll, 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 I mean, I, I showed it in the beginning. Maybe I should show it again. This is just all fakery. It's not actual simulation or anything, but it looks nice. Oh, honeycomb. So that's the working file, and uh, yeah, now the now the idea is to basically warp the input of the time here along uh, along these pillars, and for that we need a mask. So let's capture an attribute before we instance it. Because with the instancing, it's also going to be scaled around. And I want a mask that is independent of the scale. So let's take the position before instancing and then just capture the uh, Z component because that's all I need. Let's just put that in here. And then we can just take a look at that. 
is just going to be black because it's in the negatives. Hang on, let me turn that off. Yep, it goes from zero down to one because that's how we generated it. So let's take a map range node and just change that around. So it goes like this. Or actually, let's have it the other way around. So it's zero at the uh, around the zero plane, and then goes towards one along each pillar. And let's just so we can see <laughs> the idea of what's going to happen here. Let's just take a mix RGB and then mix these two vectors with this mask. And you can already kind of see what's going to happen here. So this is not quite it. This is not quite what we're going to end up with. I, I'm going to do something a little bit more fancy, not much more fancy. But uh, yeah, that's the idea. So we we map the time along each one of the pillars. Which also sounds kind of cool, which is always a benefit. So, but instead of duplicating these things, the nice thing about this input here is this can be different for each vertex of the mesh. So uh, we don't have to evaluate a bunch of different points and then map them along the pillar, we can just change the input of this because this is a field. That means we can simply just add a math node and subtract what we got here. And that looks very similar already. Let's just multiply this. And yeah, this this already looks a lot like uh, what I showed you what I ended up with with my test from earlier. Yeah, so that's kind of cool. Um, yeah, now I actually have to think about what <laughs> what else I ended up doing because this is already relatively close. But um, right, so one thing I did was using a curve to further control the influence to make it a little bit smoother that that kind of just changes the behavior of how uh, stiff each of these pillars look along uh, from uh, top to bottom. And yeah, then an additional thing that I would did, I think, was taking not only uh, not only scaling the map of this influence along with each pillar, but also having a component that is the same for each pillar. Maybe I can actually. I'm I'm not one hundred percent sure this is working as I intended. Oh yeah, of course it's not. Yeah, <laughs> so this yeah right. Uh, I'm not actually using this captured attribute. So that means the position is going to be re-evaluated um, after the instancing and the scaling. That's why all of them uh, morph the same way. If I instead use the captured attribute, they morph along uh, each pillar which gives a different behavior. And what I want is a mix of the two, basically. Right. So let's just do that. Um, let me quickly check what I did before my second monitor, just to make sure that I'm not messing anything up. Yeah, it looks good. 
All right, I just multiplied it. So to combine the two influences, I just multiply them with each other because they're both zero at the center. And that's going to give me a nice smooth result. Like this. So one is captured and gets this uh, curve effect to it to make it a little bit more smooth or characteristic. And then the other one is just multiplied on top, and then I can crank it up. And there we go. Just change some settings around to make this look a little bit nicer. There we go. It's super responsive. It's playing back at, let's quickly check, 24, let's try 60 FPS. Uh, not quite 60, but it's super responsive and super nice. And even if it's not, we can just simply change the amount of vertices here. Just going to be a little bit less, uh, yeah. You're going to see that the resolution decreases, obviously, but the behavior should remain the exact same, which is nice. Let's try 50. And then another thing that we can do is maybe... Hmm. Yeah, let's just do that. Uh, actually evaluate it twice, once to the current time and then to the uh, warped time. And then just mix between the results. Or actually, hang on. Let's make this a little bit more fancy. I want to be able to mix each individual component of X, Y, and Z with its own factor to be able to control on each axis how flexible it is, basically. Um, to do that, just a little bit of vector math. Let's see. So this is what I mix in. I subtract the base. Then I multiply it with the factor, and then I add it back to this. And just just make a note group out of that. It's gonna be a vector mix. And now let's see if it works. Wait. Ah, wait. No, no, no. The last two inputs should be the same. So this goes here, and I remove this. This is A, this is B, and then this is my factor. Okay. Let's see if that works properly. So this is as it was before. Zero is going to be nothing. And then we can blend in each individual axis and, uh, on its own. Yes, it looks good. And yeah, the main the main reason I'm doing this is to be able to control the Z component separately. Just because of gravity, this is going to make it look very different. If this is one, it's still very, very wobbly. If this is zero, it looks a little bit more like hair, something that doesn't really uh, expand all that much. Yeah, and this looks more like jello. Okay. Uh, let's just put this at a midway point at like 0.5. And yeah. I think that's the setup. That actually worked out a little bit quicker than I expected, which is really nice. Okay. Now, second part, the honeycomb. Oh. There's a bunch of Russian in the chat, I think. Okay. Let's 
keep this here. This is going to be the viewer setup. And actually, let's just separate this a little bit on the screen and move it away. This is the wiggle system. Cool. Honeycomb. Uh, for the honeycomb, we're just going to start with a very basic thing, cylinder, with six vertices. As one would expect as well. I think I'm just going to rotate this one, just because I want it to be oriented a little bit differently. So let's try and rotate it by... 180 divided by 6. Oh. What? 180 divided by 6. There we go. Well, I, I could have done that. <laughs> I could have done that in my head, I think. But <laughs> Whatever. Um, and then we make a grid. So, let's see. Yeah, let's just use two grids. So this is going to be a hexagonal grid. And the easiest way I know of doing this is by just offsetting two grids. And just take a look at this. I'm going to look at the wireframe. Hmm. The way these inputs are is not really optimal for this. Is there? No. Hmm. Actually, I'm th thinking of doing this a little bit differently. Let's take a line. This might not be the most intuitive way of making a grid, but the inputs are a little more convenient. So I'm going to uh, instance uh, on points. Where is it? There. My offset is going to be like one meter to the right. And then, oh, no along the Y, in mind, here. And then I have a second line that's going to be along the x-axis. Let's just very quickly set this up so you can see what I mean. This is the points, this is the instance, and then we instance again on the resulting grid. And there we go. And now we have a nice control of the x distance, the y distance, and the count along each, uh, each of the axes as well. Um, yes. And then I use a transform node to duplicate this thing. and then join them back together. And then we have a second grid. You can just offset like this. So that's, that's, that's the basic idea. Now let's do a little bit of math to get this aligned correctly. Um, so beforehand, I quickly looked <laughs> at some reference of how the metrics of uh, hexagonal grids work, and it's yeah, I didn't want to do the whole math, so I just looked it up. But uh, so the radius of of this circle here is basically just going to be uh, half. It's, it's half of the height, and the three quarter point is going to be where we are starting the next one. So the diff the distance here is going to be three quarter of two times the. Uh, radius. And the radius is set to be 
one here. Hello. Okay. So the math is just multiplying it with. Let's see. I'll just evaluate. Uh, I just get a value input node for the for the radius, so we can change it later if we have to. And that just needs to be uh, multiplied with six divided by four. Wait. Oh yeah. Which again I could have done in my head, but. <laughs> Where would we be if we do everything in our heads, right? Way too complicated. Um, that's going to be my x distance, yes. So combine x, y, z. x. No. Oh, plugged into the wrong thing. There we go. Hang on. Oh, no, the Y. I am sorry. This is the Y distance. Okay, now I'm confusing myself a little bit. This should be the Y distance of the second grid. So this one has to be three times up. Like this. Yes, and then here, just duplicate this. For the x distance, this is multiplying it with square root of 3, I think. Should be, just go back to the website. Because this is a triangle with 60 degrees. Uh, in all angles, you can just use the sine of 30 to calculate the um, the factor between those two lengths. And the sine of 30 degrees, oh, let's just put that in here. It's way easier to do it like this. 30 degrees to radians, sine of that, multiply x. No. Wait, do I divide? It doesn't look much better. What am I doing wrong? Just quickly try out the square root of three instead. That works. Was sine of thirty degrees wrong? Hmm. Not entirely sure, but oh well. This works. Well, would have had to go into the nitty gritty of the math to really figure that out accurately, but this works. So this is going to be half of that. And then, ah, well, I should just use the actual number so it's still hooked up to the parameters. And this is going to be half. Okay. Okay, this was a little bit more messy than I than I wanted to make it, but we got there. And now I can just easily change this around. 
Oh god. Hmm. And now because this is just the point grid that's used for instancing, it has the right metrics and everything. Uh, we can also just go in and delete a couple of these points to do some shaping of the whole thing. We can create the mask based on the position, for example. Um, yeah, let's just do a separate XYZ. Some vector math. And let's just quickly start with a circle. I think I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna do the regular stuff that I've do, been doing a lot for shading. Oh, this is the wrong one. Delete points. And for that, let me just make a very quick setup and then just show how that works. I use the length, a math node. Mm, greater than. Yes. Hmm. Okay, I'm a little bit confused right now. In theory, these points should all be at z equals zero. And then let's just get a couple more. Let's just start out with 1020, maybe. If for some reason this is not using the Y component it looks like. Looks like it's just ignoring that. Uh, okay, the issue is that I'm not realizing the instances. Of course. So the points are still instances, which is a problem. Okay. And now we can just have a portion of these hexagons in a separate place and make any shape. So let's just make a more organic shape with some curves. Um, math node. And I set that to the arctan2 to get the angular component of the coordinates around the center. Then I map that between 0 and 1 to be able to handle it better by typing in negative pi and pi as the from min max. And then that I can shape with a float curve. There we go. I thought this I thought this was fixed. Ah, maybe it's not fixed in uh, Hang on. Oh yeah. Okay, never mind. It's just a node wrangler issue. Okay. And this can then be used to create some different shapes. Yeah, I should scale this up a little bit more to have more impact. Let's go by 10 and then there's better control. Let's just take it like this just a little bit more rounded than uh, just having the base grid. 
Okay. Now let's see. Oh, yeah, obviously this should also. I mean, in the end, this should be the honeycomb grid that just has these holes in each one of the hexagons. Uh, let's go back to the original cylinder, and I think I'm just going to not fill it like this. Um, and then I will do the regular old technique that we've been using a bunch of times throughout these streams to mesh a flat surface into a thicker surface by, okay, let me just be a little bit better about my workflow and actually name this uh, grid. And then we do the meshing, so that's distributing points on these surfaces that we just generated. Yeah, let's do Poison Disk. And then, like a thousand. Should be dense enough. Also, this honeycomb that I'm creating right now is incredibly huge. Maybe, I mean, the scale is not really that important, but maybe I do want to push this a little bit smaller. Because right now, the radius of all of these hexagons is a meter. That's a bit much. But because this is set up in a way that I can change it, let's just change this to radius of a centimeter. So factor 100, and then we also need to change this by 100. And then also this one. Right. <laughs> the depth needs to also be changed because it's two meters, so two centimeters. Well, ah, maybe it was better before. <laughs> now the points are very huge. Now let's just see how it looks. So I turn the points into a volume. And everything's frozen. Point radius should be a millimeter. Yeah, <laughs> I made a mistake. Let me scale back up at least by 10. Just so it's a little bit more workable. So 0 0.1, 0 0.2, oh. and 1. And this is a centimeter. Oh, this wasn't even a millimeter. It was less. Uh, that's still reasonable. I think that's fine. Okay. And then mesh, volume to mesh. Oh, of course, now the density is just not enough because it's smaller. Like this. Fantastic. Did I not? Oh, that's very interesting. Right, I didn't realize the instances again. Which might be good, actually. Because that means it's going to be a lot more performant. Right? Let's keep it like this. 
think this is going to be fine. Oh yeah, the grid is also not working anymore. Hang on. The, the, the shape is not accurate. Mess something up. Ah, yeah, right. This needs to be different, of course. Or, rather, this needs to be divided by 10 as well. Okay. Sorry. Messed that up a little bit. But it's fine. Let's see. Okay. And this field later on we might also want to use to get a nice mask. So let's turn this all back on. That's the mesh. And let's just take a look at this mask on the new mesh. Just want to see what it looks like. It's not too bad. So that gives a relatively nice uh, view towards the edge. Hmm. Just change this a little bit so it's a bit nicer. Let's put this to point two. And this as well. So it's actually uh, starting and ending at the same distance. Yeah, and that's going to be useful later on. So let's see. Now would be time to add some actual honey into these. Or, hmm. Maybe it's also time to just look at some honeycombs. So they are usually stacked like this. Uh, so they're double. And then there's this thick layer of honey on the outside. Um, hmm, I'm not entirely certain how I want to do it. I kind of want to mostly I don't, I don't really want to go for a super realistic version, but mostly just focus on the dripping honey. Because that's the whole point of the uh, animation. So let's just make that work for now. Yeah. I think the points need to be a little bit more dense. Then let's see. I think in theory it might be good to just take the points that we use for the distribution after the unnecessary ones were deleted and then also create a mesh from those without any distribution, just like this. Hey, Serg is in the house. Sorry, I, I haven't been really following the chat today. Uh, can you please upload your work for us to play with it? Um, I'm uploading all of the November stuff this year on the uh, Blender Studio platform. So it's all going to be there. I don't think I have a link to those in the in the videos, so that's a good idea to add those. But uh, yeah, it's studio.blender.org. There's a workshop that I set up for the Geometry Node stuff, uh, the November stuff, and the files all go there. 
So now you need to calculate the closed loop integral over the surface of the interior space. <laughs> yes, that's next November. Ah, you already posted the links, even nice, thanks. Okay, so we take the points that we already have, create a volume, match that volume, and then hope that it helps. No, that I don't need to do. Just join the two. Well, that didn't work. Oh, the radius is way too small. So here the radius should be about the same as the radius of the uh, the hexagons, and that looks kind of good. Not too bad. The voxel resolution should be a little bit higher. That's actually not too bad for something I basically get for free. Ah, and he's also here. It's a huge gathering of Blender Studio people. I will also add a bunch of smoothing, as I usually do with these things. Where is it? Here. Yeah, because it just helps hiding all the all the ugly uh, secrets. Also, I'm not really certain how to deal with these intersections. I think I'm just going to ignore them. It is kind of nice that I can basically abuse the instancing aspect to uh, do the meshing on each individual uh, hexagon. I think I'm just gonna, gonna keep it like that. But I should add some more points so there's not these holes in there. Maybe it's just due to the Poisson disk. <laughs> it's already getting relatively slow, the evaluation. Oh no, that's, that's not it then. Okay, let's just crank it, crank it up by two. There we go. Very clean. But yeah, I kind of like that these edges, these kind of rough edges also help with the style a little bit because it's not to be, uh, supposed to be super clean. It's an actual honeycomb. For the radius of these, maybe I can get away with a little bit uh, less. So let's hide this just to take a look. radius let's try 0.08 oh that's yeah no <laughs> that doesn't work hmm. I do really want to avoid using a boolean operation because those make everything slow maybe we just need more smoothing <laughs> <laughs> the smoothing helps, but everything is super slow. Well, let's just skip this for now. Assume that it's all going to work out and do something else in the meantime. Um, this is getting a little bit too slow, though. The evaluation takes quite a while now. This is somewhat also due to the smoothing off uh, of course but let's just set up a resolution factor again just have a value input and let's also hook it up to the viewport with a switch so on the viewport this resolution uh, uh on the render this resolution slider is doesn't have any effect uh floats So if it is the viewport, I want to use the slider, otherwise I'll use one. And that I multiply with 
whatever go is going to be the max. And here, this means 64. And here, 128. Also kind of tired of these <laughs> curved noodles. I gotta turn them off again. Um, there we go. Twenty-eight. There we go. And now, oh yeah, this is zero. Set this to point five. It still kind of works. One it takes a while. There we go. Nice. So, <laughs> uh, the bee puns in the in the chats. I like it. Where's the extrude node? There is no such thing yet. I'm assuming that it's going to be a thing in three point one because. Uh, it's relatively high on the priority list, but it's not in 3.0. Okay, there we go. Oh, has been answered already. Never mind. Don't forget to save. Yes, thank you. Doing it right now. Um, okay, a little bit more space. And now... Hmm, the question is how do I do the honey that is drooping down? So I could just... Hmm. I'm not exactly sure where I wanted to actually be if it's going to be covering it all over the place around or I mean in theory honeycombs are like closed off right I'm not really going to show the backside so I don't really care about that but I think the honey is just going to be on the outer rim on the bottom and for that I need to do add an additional mesh, uh, I think. Maybe even, let's, yeah, let's try that. Let's take, yes, I think that's a good idea. Let's take this step again, and then delete some of the geometry, specifically the top part, so just check for the position, take the Z component, and actually compare it with a number, and greater than zero are removed. There you go. So that's just the bottom grid. And then that I try and fill from a curve. Okay, first it has to be curved though. Let's do mesh to curve. Ah, mesh to curve. There you go. Now we have a mesh. And do the exact same thing as here again. Beautiful. Now we have a basis for this thing. Let's join this as well. Oh, where is it? Should it? What? 
Shouldn't this be at the bottom? What happens at this step? Ah, did I? Yes, I need to realize again. <laughs> well. Okay, most, most of the points of confusion boil down to realize instances. Or do they? <laughs> I am not less confused, I have to admit. Why is it moving up? Yeah, apparently the realizing wasn't really <laughs> the issue here. And I really don't know what the issue really is. Especially because it's just moving the points up for no reason. So when I convert it to a curve, it's all still fine. But filling the curve is an issue. Um, this should also be fine. What if I, oh, hey, the first crash. <laughs> it still crashes once in a while. I mean, we are using an alpha version, but usually things are fine. See how much work we lost. I mean, I was fiddling around with something that didn't work anyway, so. This should be it. There we go. Nothing lost. Confusion is still there. Very unfortunate. Okay, let's see. I convert it to a curve first, and then I remove spines. That looks fine. It doesn't help, but hmm. I'm terribly confused. I mean, I can just brute force it and move it back down. Maybe. Oh, I'm assuming that this is just how this node works that it uh, ignores the Z component of curves. Like when I, okay, let's just try that out. If I just do a transformation. No, that works. What? It doesn't make a lot of sense. Okay, what if instead of the transformation I do a set position? Because maybe the transformation is just smart. Let's see. Ah. Yeah, it looks like it's scaling, scaling it to zero along the z axis for some reason. Very interesting. Okay. A little bit of a tangent. But let's just go for the simple fix of moving it back down. So I got a transform operation and go all the way back to the depth and hook it up to that. Okay. Point two. It's my depth. Point one was the radius. And then use it here. Just 
now I realize the curves are back. Let's get rid of them. Okay. And then combine XYZ to build the vector. And the depth has to be halved and negated. So let's do this. Does it work? Yes, I think so. Yeah, that looks good. Nice. Okay. And then it's meshed. And then we have this. Fantastic. Or actually, now this is the same as before, where it's still instanced. It's also why it's evaluating so quickly. Let's just see how bad the evaluation time gets if I realize the instances. Uh, not too bad. It's reasonable. Oh, right. The voxel amount is the same. Let's see, maybe. Let's just hook this up to the resolution factor as well. Like this. Yeah. Why does it make no difference? Oh, it's set to 0.5. Right. Here. While I'm at it, let's just expose this value. Take a oh, mix RGB to get a nice factor slider. And then hook that up instead. There you go. Then it should probably still be a little bit higher. Yeah, I think that's got to be this. So now it's closed off at the bottom. And this I'll also use for the honey. I mean, it's yeah, it's not going to be an actual lid on the back side. It's just going to be the honey. Uh, why don't you use the group input to... Ex Explore, uh, yes, dude. <laughs> what was the what was the name? What was the word? Expose, yes. Yeah, I don't do that enough. I should do it more. You're right about that. View port resolution. Okay, but I don't also want to go overboard with uh, exposing too many things because that's just doesn't make any sense. So I really want to expose only things that uh, I want to control specifically. Okay. This gets the viewer. And then so this is the base mesh. This is this was the grid. This is the group input. Let's keep it separate. And this is the base mesh. And for that, let's finally get into some displacement. Okay. So this is going to use the same concept as the pizza that I did, the pizza slice that I did for the first prompt. And, um, yeah, there I made these droops of uh, cheese downwards. So, this place. Oh, no. Set position. And first, I need a mask of the outer edge because that's where I want to have the things droop down. Or actually. Mm. 
Let's just create the droops everywhere. We can still use the mask later on. Why not? Okay, but first I want to have some... Uh, just I want to thicken up the layer of honey a little bit. So let's just do a little bit of normal displacement. Normal, select the math. Nope. Ah, <laughs> just created that myself. So now it's in the way of searching. Scale. And we just iterate a bunch of times. I'll just kill these connections for now. So it doesn't evaluate the node tree all the time. Because right now I, I just want to duplicate some stuff. Connect some nodes. For that I don't need to reevaluate the tree. Six steps should definitely be enough. And now let's take a look. Oh god. Yeah, well, I shouldn't do this. <laughs> this step I shouldn't do on the result, on the whole thing, but rather just on the honey itself. That makes more sense. Okay, still a little bit too strong. Also, the resolution still needs to be much more, I, I'm afraid. This is not connected correctly. Yeah, I mean, this is a little bit too strong anyways. Let's also turn on the smoothing to get a better grip of what's going to happen. Hmm, yeah, 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 no. This needs more resolution for sure. But let's just take a look at it with full resolution, because that's changing a bunch of stuff anyways. That is actually not too bad. Hmm. I could just keep it like this. I don't know, maybe, yeah. Uh, let's go all the way to 512. It's going to be very high res and not going to be playing back at... Uh, what's going on here? Oh, it's because of the smoothing. It's not going to be playing back real time, but that's fine. We always have this resolution slider to just... Turn that down for the viewport. Oh god. 0.5 for now. And now let's create a mask for the droops of honey. For that, just a noise texture with some float curve. And the input is, of course, going to be the position. Well, technically, I wouldn't have to do this because if I just leave this empty, it's going to, by default, use the position field. But I like to just add these just to make visually very clear what the input is. It makes it a little bit easier to debug things if you actually expose the inputs specifically like this. And that goes more like this. Got to still figure this out later. But for now, let's just see how this looks. Here, I just want to have some more vector math to scale up a vector along the negative z-axis. 
with this mask. And yeah, there we go. Now I just want to have this kind of displacement only at the bottom side. So I also scale it with a mask that I create from the normal. I can just copy that from here. And to get the mask, I compare the normal using a dot product with negative one. Along the z-axis. And then, yeah, let's take a map, map range. Let's just keep it like this for now. And that's going to be another scale. And then I have another factor to just scale how much this should affect the result. Hmm. Okay. Let's see, this is not too great. I mean, it is way too strong, obviously. So let's just see how it looks when it's less. Hmm, not that much better. Also, scale down this displacement a little bit. And this should probably have less detail. Hmm. Hmm, the issue here is that, oh yeah, let me try out something. Let's power this up by something like four. Looks a little bit better. It's better to use 1D and noise texture for performance. Well, I mean, it depends on your noise. Here, 1D wouldn't work because 1D. Hello? Oh, uh, why not? Because it's just going to be along a single dimension. So that doesn't work. But uh, 2D would work. You can use 2D. I don't think the performance difference is that significant with the other things that we're doing. I think those, like the, the, the volume remeshing is more draining on the performance, I think, than this. But yeah, in theory, it's, it's a little bit better. Hmm. I was hoping for this to be a little bit nicer. But I'm afraid I might just need a whole bunch more resolution. Hmm. Maybe I can somewhat cheat my way around this though. How do I get nice and long streaks of geometry? So ideally I wouldn't just start from a flat surface but already have these kind of shapes with a nice topology. I mean, I could before just uh, before meshing this or distributing the points already just have a bunch of uh, point lines hanging down and then mesh those as well. Maybe I should do that. Feed the milk, they'll turn more Dutch. <laughs> Remesh again, yeah, nah. 
the thing is, I mean, I could do that, but the workflow, the, the, the performance would be terrible, which it's already not great. But yeah, displays, remesh, displays, remesh <laughs> would probably also work. But I do want to try uh, just adding a couple more points here. Let's see, mesh line. Oh God, it's already relatively slow. Is it even there? Shouldn't there be a nice Line somewhere. Let's see. Where are the points? Do I have to convert the mesh to points? Ah, there they are. They were hiding. Hmm. Um, I mean, ideally, I would also distribute those. Okay, let's give it a try. I'm I'm committing to this uh, to this test say like this and then I instance the lines on these like this and I don't join that yeah kind of kind of Let's just see how that looks after the meshing. Mm. Ah. I need to realize the instances as usual. Wait. But is that smart to do at this point? Sure. Cool. Looks a bit strange. Um. Well, I guess in theory, the points that I'm creating here can have a, a higher radius, uh, but I'm not sure I can, uh, let's see. Okay, I'll just try. I capture an attribute. Nice boolean, and then I switch. Oh, wait, no, I capture it before I capture. Captured here, I think. <laughs> And I switch for the radius between 0 0.1, uh, between one centimeter and let's say five centimeters. Does that work? No. Does it not work? Do 
Do I need to realize again? But in theory, this should work though. Because the points. Ah, it's <laughs> my bad. I forgot to set this to true. So the Boolean should be true on this part of the geometry, and by default, it's going to be uh, false on the rest. And that means false is going to be the rest, and the default is here. So let's see how oh, that looks smoothed. Marvelous. Okay, it doesn't look it doesn't look amazing, but that's fine. At least this has a whole bunch of uh, vertices all over the place that we can use, which is fantastic. Uh, okay, let's see. I missed some stuff. Geometry nodes is like shading with math. Hmm. Shading has a bunch of math. But yeah, the the system as we have it with fields now in geometry nodes is very, very similar to how the shader nodes in Blender work. So you can hold, do a whole lot of stuff. Hey there, Dino. Loops? No, the two simplify the recursive steps. Uh, like this stuff. Would be cool, yeah. I mean, it's on the agenda for some point to also add some looping. Um, there are different concepts of how to loop or over what to loop, like similar to to something like Python loops, for example. You can just loop over elements of a list, for example. So you can uh, yeah, something that would be very very cool to do would be to have. A mesh with a bunch of vertices and then loop over the vertices. So you do an operation for each of the vertices separately. That way that we don't have to, because what we're doing right now is basically working on all of the vertices at the same time. But instead we could do an operation for a single vertex and then also look at the neighbors and stuff like that. And then there's the kind of looping where you just want to do the same thing a bunch of times like this. Which is a little bit simpler, but yeah, uh, different different concepts of how to loop. That's gonna be a thing in the future. I'm not sure where exactly it is on the on the roadmap, but we already spent a little bit of time thinking about it at some point. Okay, I do want to. Yeah, why not? Let's just do that now. I will just create a mask along these kind of pillars that goes from zero to one all the way down. Oh, I didn't even read all the chat. <laughs> Been skipping on stuff. I like the idea of using lines that point down. You could maybe even use curves to shape droplets. Mm. It's a little bit too advanced. <laughs> I was thinking of just doing the exact same thing that I was doing for the pizza. You do have a point that maybe that m would make it easier. But I'm kind of missing a, a solid remeshing workflow for that kind of stuff because I do want to have the whole thing joined together at the end. I think for now I'll just stick to the displacement based uh, workflow. Curve to mesh and curve profile. Yeah, I, I I see what you mean. I think it it's not a bad idea, but I want it to be very much just one mesh. Ah, Hans is also here. Okay. Right. So I need the mask. And that mask is just going to be a very simple Z position based thing. Well, actually, I need to create it after the meshing. So exactly here. 
and then I'll just capture capture it right here. This out of the way. And then map range. Oh, how did that work? And this goes from it's forty eight points. Hmm. Just say fifty. So that's half a meter down because it's fifty times one centimeter. So from negative point five, even though I need to maybe also consider this. Yeah, because the radius of of the points is five centimeters. So let's start at negative point five five. Go to zero, should be fine. And I map it to zero and one. It's gonna be captured and let's take a look at that in the oh in the viewer here all ah, right not zero maybe negative half the depth where was that i had it somewhere Here. Okay, that's the wrong socket. There. Better. Let's let's keep it at that for now. It's gonna be fine. Okay. Okay, now a bunch of displacement. There's a bunch of different things that I want to do. So these should have different length and thickness. Right now it's just very, very uniform. I mean, it doesn't look good at all. Um, so kind of lost the grasp of what exactly is going on here. So this was what was this? Some displacement. Forgetting what this was. Oh, this was the noise displacement that I tried. Yeah, let's just remove this for now. I'll just scoot it to the side. I don't think we're going to use that. Not the way it is. Um. And this was just the growth. I don't. Th hmm. Not sure that's super necessary here. Well, let's just keep it for now. Or maybe after the stuff that I'm doing now. Okay. Need to do some more displacement. Along the normal. Some vector math. And I want to first just control the Z axis and just scale some of these uh, pillars down along the Z axis. 
Actually, uh, I'm gonna need a noise for that again, but that's fine. And the way I'm gonna do that is just by... Oh. Not by doing this. Actually, for this I don't need a normal for now. So forget about that. But instead... Hmm. Right. I'll just take the position. And I multiply it. And for the multiplication, I use a noise texture. But I want to multiply it around the, uh, oh, crash. I think I should really try and, where is it? What? This one. Uh, gotta retrace my steps, so I removed this. And to mitigate another crash, I think I'm just going to turn off the evaluation by just removing the output here. Right. And we go back to adding nodes. So the position. Position. Vector math. Gonna be multiply. I'm gonna need this. This is the uh, the height of where the origin of the scale is going to be. So f before scaling, I'm going to subtract this. And after is it added back? That will that way I will scale it around this height with the uh, multiplication. All oh, right, I didn't connect it. So yeah, if I scale this along the z-axis. This is relatively slow. <laughs> oh yeah, now I... Hmm. Now that I changed the method of how I'm creating these pillars, I think I can just uh, reduce the resolution for these as well. Now it should be much easier to get a good resolution on these. Let's try this. Let's also turn on this, turn off the smoothing for now. And then Right, if I scale this down, you can see that it scales around the the bottom side here. If I have these disabled, it shifts that around as well. That's why I first subtract and then add it back to have the center of this scaling operation at a different spot. Okay, what is happening on here? I'm making uh, a... <laughs> okay, it's, it's true, you can't really see what's happening when you're looking at this. But we're making a honeycomb with some drooping honey. So this is the honeycomb. The drooping honey is yet to be drooped. But we already have a preparation of a very nice wiggle system wiggle around the drooping honey. Why is it so slow? Should it completely ignore the rest? Ah, the field was still 
It was trying to evaluate the fields on this geometry. There you go. So that's going to be the wiggle in the end. So now we need some nice drooping honey. And for that, we use a noise to drive the scaling. Over here. Uh, yep, just the position 2D. And that's just going to be on the Z component. The rest is going to be 1. And here I'm just going to add a map range. Let's just try this. What are we looking at here? Okay, so the noise needs to be all the way soft and larger, I think. Mm. I was hoping this would be a little bit smoother. Well, after smoothing, this looks okay-ish. Let's just see what it looks like if after this I also do the uh, uh, the shape of the droops. Or actually this... no. No, no, no. Okay, so I duplicate this because this is exactly what we need. A bunch of iterative displacement. And it's going to use the normal and also be scaled with this nice mask that we created earlier here. And then to control the influence of that, I'm going to also use a float curve. And I think actually I might even go into the negatives. Hmm. Maybe it's not a smart move. Let's just keep it at this for now. Okay, it looks a bit strange. <laughs> Without smoothing it looks even stranger. See if making this negative can help. Um, where did I change the? Oh yeah. No. Where did I change the clipping of this? Ah, here. Okay. So now we can also go into the negative values. This is, of course, way too extreme. Mm, point 0.1. Oh, what? Ah, point 0.2. Let's just take a look at uh, how this how this looks with the whole result because maybe I'm just missing context. Oh, this is not it. There we go. Uh, it's something. Right, I do th think I probably need this as well. This was the 
general thickness. Hmm. Maybe I just need to, instead of doing this, yeah, I'm going to try that. Uh, instead of this, just increase the radius of uh, this surface, which was over here somewhere. Here. I'm not exactly sure what's happening here. I guess it's still getting affected a little bit by the negative displacement here. Let's try this. Yeah, maybe this. Ah. May I? Yes, better, much, much better. Okay, it's still not ideal. It does look a, bit, uh, a little bit strange still, but we can figure that out. One thing I want to try as well is what it looks like if I transform this honeycomb. Just rotate it around a little bit. And that should happen before the droops are created. So that was here, right? No, that was the scaling that should happen after. Oh, yeah, no. Ah. Hmm. Yeah, this makes things a little bit more complicated. The meshing. Hmm. So the now that the droops are created as lines that are distributed earlier on if I want to actually have them orient along the global z-axis, I need to do this a little bit differently. I'll figure that out later. For now, let's just increase this. To see if it even works at all. For the noise, I don't want to scale it down all that much. Let's See this? Uh, it's, it's it's something. Okay. Oh, I've been missing a conversation in the chat. Okay, I don't think I can catch up with everything that's in the chat right there, but I'm glad you guys are talking. Time curve. Sounds very interesting. So the thing is, in theory, I could try and just orient these in the first place as I'm distributing them. But I don't think this is going to cause the result that I want. So instead, I think I'm going to try and fix it after. So additionally to um, 
capturing this attribute, I think I'm also going to capture the position directly. Just talking about animation tooling, that's nice. <laughs> that's always good. Position. Can I fix this? Hmm. So eventually what I want is that the position of the vertices stays aligned to the ones that are above or that were above. Question is, can I somehow do this after the fact? Hmm. I'm not really sure. I could try and do something with an attribute transfer. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So one thing I'm thinking of, but I don't really want to do that right now, uh, would be to do some ray to shoot some rays then read out the x and y position and then align those I'm not so sure that's the best thing to do though Falk David has a good suggestion I think what that wouldn't it be better to change the lengths of the lines there that you are remissing? Huh. <laughs> that would definitely be better, yes. <laughs> Why was I not doing that? That's a good idea. Huh. Well, well, well. Wait. Yeah, the problem with that is I need I need to have an attribute in the end that is going from 0 to 1 all the way along each one of those. So I need to know the length. And the way I was doing that right now was just keeping the length the same until I have that attribute. But if I do it the other way that I... Uh, that I scale them differently in the first place, then I need to have the scale later on to map that back, if that makes sense. So that would, uh, I could I could do that with, uh, by just cutting them off with the noise and then using that same noise to read out the length. I feel like I might end up with the same issue though because then the attribute that goes along is not accurate anymore. <laughs> Ray tracer and geometry nodes, yeah, 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 yeah. In theory, why not? Much easier to just use the ray cast nodes. Oh, I, I guess you could use that node and then, then do ray tracing that way. <laughs> no, I just... I don't need a coffee. I, I'm very much awake. I just need a little bit of water. Ah, energized. Okay. Good. Now let's just why not? Before I do anything else. To to make this work better. Let's just hook it up 
to the thing that we did in the very beginning. The wiggle system. So... The wheel system needs an attribute. Which is probably just going to be this. So let's take a look if that actually would work. I think so. So it's it's black for everything but the droops, and there it gradually increases. That's good. Then that can be directly used for. Uh, you know what? Let me duplicate this so we don't lose it. I think it's going to be very underwhelming because it's just going to be very, very slow. Like the performance is not going to hold up at all. So we're going to we're going to have to look at it like this. Um, yes, and then I pipe this geometry through here. And for the mask here, delete this. This mask, I use this instead. Why is nothing happening? Ah, right, the driver broke when I was duplicating, so let's make it new. Look at that. Oh, the resolution is not quite there. But it does wiggle. So that works. It's going to be relatively difficult to judge this without actually seeing it the way that it was intended. Um, <laughs> so yeah, maybe I should render out a viewport sequence. Dropping a few frames, yeah. Oh, the, the, the stream, I thought you meant the blender because that is definitely gonna drop a few frames here. In theory, with the setup here, it's sh yeah. The I don't know if you guys can still hear me, but in theory, the setup here shouldn't be affected by this because there's a separate streaming uh, computer. Yeah, this doesn't even look all that great on full resolution. I gotta admit. <laughs> What is going on? Did I mess things up here? In theory, yeah. It can't just be a coincidence. But it uh, it is showing red in OBS right now, so... Stream gone completely now. Sound is fine, but the stream is still choppy. Hmm. Okay. That's good to know, though. Maybe someone is heavily sync thinging stuff back and forth. Maybe. There's a bunch of people that are using this, uh, the internet here at the studio, so maybe it's due to that. But as long as the, the audio is still fine, that's, that's good to know. But yeah, this is 
<laughs> this is not really working out. The shapes here. I wasn't imagining this way different. So the big issue is the connection here. That should just be way, way smoother. Maybe I should. Hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking of going back to the displacement approach instead of the strings. Even though I could try. Yes, let me try that. Instead of simply. Oh, what's going on? It looks like Pablo is starting to stream as well. Oh, yeah, it's Monday. Mm hmm. That might be it then. Last time, last time it seemed to be fine though. Last Monday. But yeah, I'm going to try and also use this same concept here to change the radius of the points in the first place to have a much smoother connection at the top. So let's see. Uh, this was the from max. And then that I use a float curve. Is it still is it still really bad the stream quality? It is flickering around here. Keyboard is crapping itself as well. It's not nice. Curve. Yeah, I'll just I'll just keep going with the stream. I'll just finish this up here. Okay, math node. So this was at five centimeters. So let's see. Um, yeah, no, I should use another map range. So right now I'm just trying to change the radius of these points. So it just gives a nicer shape. For that, it should be more like this. At least I hope that's going to work. That means, let's see, point 0.2 maybe. Mm hmm. So this is what it was before, and now it's this. That's better. And then on top of that, there's this.
And then there's the animation. Okay, the honey here on the side gets a little bit outrageous, though. Also, it should be more on the edge itself. But with this technique, I don't think that's even going to work that way. Okay, the... Pablo can't get his stream started? Oh. It shouldn't be a PC issue. I, I'm assuming that it is a network issue. Because like I said, it is a separate computer, so that should be an issue. Now it is a lot better. Now it's also showing for me, but I guess that Pablo just stopped trying to stream. That's what it sounds like. I could also instead just call this stream for now because I don't think I'm going to do all this much. I'm still going to fix a bunch of things before I post it, but I don't think it's all that interesting anyways then. I just got to fix some stuff so it looks a bit nicer. Uh, looks great now. Okay. Okay, then I'll just do a little bit more trying to fix things. Let's see. So in theory, now I should also have a nice parameter to just change. Oh, it's fixed with Palo as well. Okay, cool. Nice. Okay. That's good. Um, yeah. Yeah, that doesn't look all too great, but just to show that it works in theory. You can just change the around. This should also still be fine. <coughs> Excuse me. But yeah, now obviously these spheres are really... Hmm, they're going all over the place. Oh. At least this is working quite reliably. Who would have thought that this would be the easy part, the the whole animation thing? Now it has to be. Uh, now it has to look nice as well. Maybe. Yeah, let's just try changing this profile again a little bit. And also, I gotta fix this. So this I can relatively easily fix. Because I can just hide it. Worst case, even just delete the geometry, actually. And the issue is the stuff on the side. Yeah, let's just get rid of the stuff up top in the beginning. So maybe the best thing to do would be using, where was it? This. this and then we have this hmm 
there's a bunch of things that I could try. I could sh I could shrink wrap the geometry to this plane, but only for geometry that's actually got matching normals, so it'll only do it for the top part. Other than that, hmm. I could just delete it, but then I really gotta fix it on the on the edge somehow. Also, I feel like the result for the drooping parts were just much better on the pizza example, and there I was just using displacement, but it was also a much smaller area, so I would have to use less geometry. So I kind of want to try and fix that as well in a way that it looks nicer. Because this is kind of a nightmare. Oh god. Why is this happening? Okay. Let's go back to the map range of the radius. And just try a couple more parameter, uh, a couple more values. This one. Interestingly, this shouldn't... Wait, what? Mm, right, I'm changing the wrong value. Also, it's very slow. Oh god. Yeah, that's why we created this slider in the beginning, so... We can actually do some work with lower resolution. Zero two point one. Hmm. feel less and less confident in the whole method of using the lines. This just doesn't look too great. Eh. I'm going to actually try the displacement again. I'm not too happy about this. So let's parallel back. This I'll just mute. All right. Or actually I'll just make a I'll just save a copy of this file. And then delete it so I can go back later. So I'll just make a backup of this. and then delete a bunch of stuff. But not at full resolution. This goes away, and then for this, I'm gonna need another map, but that's fine. I think I actually still, oh yeah, this can go as well. Yeah, this I still saved from earlier. So that's just what I can use instead. And that's gonna be set position here. And then it should be just like this and for this here, I should be able to just use this mask. Let's 
see. Okay. Hmm. <laughs> of course, this doesn't work super well either. But I have a little bit more confidence of being able to make this work. Let's see. I need to turn this back so I can actually do something. Got a little bit more space. And then here. Hmm. Let's get rid of the power. Just shape it more manually. Actually get a map range before that. Between point to five, point seven five. Huh. This is really, really just the smoothing. It's getting rid of all this stuff. But I mean, the issue is that now I have less resolution because I got decreased it earlier. So I think I'm actually going to have to give this back. That's the right one, right? Yeah, let's go. Let's try this. Actually, I'm thinking of, yeah, I think this is just too large. Just let's just go for a much smaller chunk just for a different scale factor in general, because then I also need less resolution. And it's also going to look a little bit nicer. I think this is just too much, too many cells of the honeycomb. And the way to do that was here. There you go. It's better. Like this. Okay, there's a bunch of very strange artifacts going on, but can fix that. I think, yeah, I think it's going to be much, much better working with this amount. It's going to help. Okay, Let's turn the smoothing back on because that makes everything better. Mm, most of the time. <laughs> uh, okay, this is the noise that's creating the droops. Okay, let's go with this for now. But then we have the normal offsets. Is that just everywhere? Shouldn't it be scaled better with this? Let's take a look at the, at the mask that this is creating. Ah. Okay, I need to <laughs> I need to do this differently. Where is it? Here. Oh yeah, also this is not helping. This should be 
starting at zero. More like this. That's the mask. Oh, no, I'm not capturing it. Ah, that's the issue, I think. Right, I need to capture this mask. Okay. Um, this... Yeah, before. Capture... Because otherwise it's just going to be reevaluated all the time. And that should help. Yes. We take a look at that in full resolution. Maybe it's just falling apart completely. Eh. Mm. Right. I th think I will need to do that last uh, step here after the smoothing. And then the only issue is that we don't have a smoothing node yet, so I will have to do that with an additional modifier. But that's fine. Just gonna be this step. And then this stuff as well. A theory that could also just be its own modifier. But yeah, let's separate that. Just turn it off for now. Duplicate this modifier. Put it after the smoothing. Make it its own data block. And then... What's this? Ah, that's the mask. Wait. Oh, this is also wrong now. Right, but that's fine. This needs to come from the outside of the modifier now. Hmm, this needs to also be joined though, afterwards. Uh, this would be so much easier if there was a smooth node. I could just do it inside the node tree and wouldn't have to worry about any of this. Hmm. Yeah, that's a bit frustrating. So I need to merge this. Makes everything so much more complicated. I kind of don't want to do that. Mm, what if I keep it without... Can I make it work somehow? Blender, there we go. Yeah, the, the issue is that I'm using, I'm relying on the normals for the displacement here. And those are just completely jagged. 
and all over the place. So if I just go one step before I'm doing the whole normal uh, displacement, it looks like this. And it's using those normals for the for the shape of the displacement. So if I could just smooth it right there. Mm, it would still be relatively jagged. So part of the issue is, or yeah, probably the biggest issue is just the edge here. Hmm. Waiting for the evaluation of the note tree takes a long time now at this point. Well, what if I try and just give this base layer more thickness so the edges aren't that granular? Where even was that? <laughs> Just gonna find it in the tree somewhere. I mean, it should be here. That should be this. I think that might help with the general uh, noise in the base mesh. Oh, it's already, did it help? A little bit. Okay, what if I just reduce the amount of this effect. It's not too bad. was worse earlier on. Yeah, that was just a little bit unfortunate of how uh, how long this takes to evaluate. So <laughs> the preview looks like this. Did it? Ah, uh, the mask for the evaluate for the for the animation doesn't work now, so I have to replace it 
with this. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, at least we can see that it's doing something. There's still a couple of improvements that I that I could do. Uh, I'll do a little bit more cleanup of this for actually rendering it and stuff and make a couple of smaller changes to make it look a little bit nicer, I think. Um, but yeah, for me, the main point was this animation thing. And yeah, that is working quite nicely. So yeah, I'm happy with that. I think for the stream, I'm just call it this. Let's turn it out to full resolution for once again. The droops still need to be adjusted a little bit, but no. As you can see, it's not very responsive right now, so it's kind of difficult. Oh, this moving is off as well. Ah, <laughs> uh, the thing takes so long. I mean, that's what you get when you work with a mesh that has millions of polygons and is generated procedurally. That's just how it is. But yeah, I'll, I'll keep it at this for the stream. We got somewhere. It's recognizable as a honeycomb. The animation, as I said, works quite nicely, I think. And uh, yeah. I'll make another breakdown for this and see where that gets me. But yeah, uh, next stream is going to be tomorrow uh, again already because, like I said, I needed to catch up a little bit with this one today. Did you press the turbo button? Ah, yeah. All right, next time. Then everything is going to be fast. Blender today? Oh, it's starting now? No, Pablo was already doing it, right? Okay. Yeah, everybody go to Blender today, hang out with Pablo. And yeah, see you again tomorrow.